The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by the Elite Experience Elite Shotguns and is fueled by Fioki. Oh. Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast, coming in hot with everything you want to hear about sporting clays. Guy Fieri. How are you, gentlemen? Thanks for having me. Anthony Batteries Jr., how you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. Welcome back, David Radulovic. Yeah, that's a net positive. <laughs> Brad Kidd. Corey Cruz. Thank you for joining us this evening. Now I feel awkward. With your hosts, Jason Rambo. No more Red Bull for you. And Sean Alley. Woo, yeah! Christmas. Let's do it. Often imitated, but never duplicated. It's the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. And now, it's showtime. All right, Sean Alley, we're back in studio with guests yet again. Yep, another full house. Another full house. Welcome back, the lovely Miss Don Grant. Thank you, thank you. The very lucky Joe Skull. And, of course, we've got Chad Roberts hiding back there. Of course, he's not on the microphone this time. He's, no, he's on a sidebar. He, so. He's in full observation mode. Correct. So Correct. This is awesome. Uh, Joe, you're in town setting targets for the Ohio State Sporting Clays Championship at Cardinal Center. I know we had done with a, a podcast with you previously, um, but can you remind our listeners how many years have you been setting targets? Now, Don, you be easy. Be nice. Joe, how, seriously, how many years have you been setting targets? I think it's about 31. Really? Yeah. Now, have you been to set targets at Cardinal before for anything else? Never. So this is your first time? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, so when you go into a tournament, Joe, do you actually start planning way before you get there? Or do you just kind of wait till you – I mean, because if you haven't been to Cardinal, you know, I'm sure you can look at an overhead – Maybe kind of see the land that they have, but you really probably need to be boots on the ground on the course to really see what you have to work with, right? I have to see it. Okay. And so you basically do you do a drive around and start putting ideas together? How do how do you how do you start formulating your your mad scientist, you know, approach? Um, basically I'll take a ride through the course and see what the holes look like and what, what space I have and where I can use specialties and get the most out of that target. Okay. And then go from there. So what after you did your ride around at Cardinal, what were some of the challenges that you were up against setting targets there? I mean, what? I mean, obviously we all know sun, wind, you know, shot fall. Those are common things. But what were some of the challenges that Cardinal presented to you? Believe it or not, there wasn't too many because Cardinal's so big and almost everything faces north. I've only had a couple stations where I had to make sure the targets were lower. Okay. Other than that, ninety-nine percent of it was. It's very easy to set because you don't have to fight with the sun and um you can do a lot more with your targets gotcha gotcha which awesome. is great because not most facilities aren't like that yeah i mean i'm sure you probably set targets where you're limited quite a bit i've set many of them yeah that's got to be <laughs> frustrating for you you know um you know each club has its own unique set of challenges when you're setting targets you know we talked about that of course you're not as limited at, at cardinal center but Talk about some of the things you do at first. I mean, I know you just told Sean you ride around that kind of thing to analyze, but what is it that you're analyzing on the course? What are you looking for when you do your ride around? Is it do you do you already have? Let me back up. Let me let me preface this question with this: Do you already have in your mind certain targets that you're going to set throughout the course, and then when you ride around, you say, "Whoop, that won't work there. This will work here. This won't work there." What is it in your analyzing that you see when you drive around mostly i just pull into that station look that station over and something pops in my head and i go ahead and set it really that's so kind of like freelance almost yeah. yep. that's awesome so you just take a like a one station at a time approach then yep. i'll just go through okay. it one at a time and, and do you I, you have like an overall like when you're planning a course i mean a lot of target setters talk about i set this so that the max score is going to be about a 94 or a 95 is that something that you put in your brain I always try to set it where it's going to be somewhere as high score should be around anywhere from 95, 97. Okay. For the top shooters. Okay. And then it can, depends on what you set. You could, you could set any course almost and have a 97. Okay. But there might be only one 97, and there might not be another 90 in the whole shoot. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at the, the whole barometer of shooters. A lot of times I go on and I look at the shoot and I say, well, you got 500 shooters, but you only got 100 master class shooters and you only got three that are really you put their name on the paper they're the ones that's going to win it so now you got to take into consideration for the other 497 people there and make something so they enjoy it but you still got to make it challenging to a point and you got to make it interesting 
Yeah. Along those lines, so what is it, in your opinion, that makes a, a quote-unquote good target versus a quote-unquote bad target? You know, what, what would you – what does Joe Skull consider a good target or a bad target? A good target is something that the shooter can see very visible and has time to shoot it, and it's in within a reasonable amount of distance. Okay. For the presentation of the target. Right. And what about the bad target? What 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 do you think is a common? This is a no no in my opinion. A wrong color target in in the background, uh, on edge, super fast where you have a hard time picking it up to see it to begin with. That that's usually just the sun. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, basically something that's that becomes an eye test. Right, you know, yeah. that's yeah. that's what you try to avoid. I w- definitely want to avoid that at, at all cost. Yeah, and w- and we've heard it said before. I think you know Dan Bailey said it one time. He said, "Look, you can be a lazy target setter because anybody can set a seventy yard crosser, and sure, it's going to be hard for almost everybody to hit it, right? Right. But it's it's harder to set a twenty yard crosser that most people are going to miss. Something that they misread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make them so they misread it. Make it so that you got their gun out of position." when they shoot the first bird to shoot that easy bird and they just take it for granted and take their gun over there and shoot at it. Gotcha. So you're kind of running through a whole mental checklist. You're, you're, you're actually envisioning yourself as a shooter in the box. Yeah. And when that bird flies, what happens from A to B? And then as that second bird flies, what happens from C to D? Where they're going to pick it up, what they're going to rush to or panic on that bird when they really don't need to. Right. Because the way I present the pair of targets, right. you'll feel like you got to rush to get this one so you can get to the other one. Well, you, now you miss both of them. <laughs> well, Don, and, and you know, we, we probably should have started off the pot. We kind of just dove right in here. We Heck yeah, started. let's get after the good stuff. Uh, we, we probably should have started off with this. But, Don, you and I had a conversation on the phone, and we had talked about a few different things when it comes to target setting. Let's start with the strength of an event can be based on who is setting the targets there. Um, can you explain to our listeners what I mean by this? I mean, you and I had that conversation, but sometimes, and y- you know, listen, we're very, bl- let me back up before you answer. We're very blessed that we have almost 600 shooters here for the Ohio state mm-hmm. shoot, but there's a lot of things that contribute to that. Yes. We're putting up a good purse this year. Um, Sean and I have touted it a lot on the podcast. Uh, yes. I'm tooting my own horn a little bit and Sean is too. Mar- but, Ohio boys. Come on. Yeah. But Another big allure is that Joe Skull is here setting targets. And Joe Skull is known around this nation for throwing good targets. And I'm sure if you had to ask somebody, give me your top three reasons for being to this high state shoot, Joe's going to be one of those three answers. So can you explain a little bit what I mean about the strength of an event based off of the target setter? Yeah, it's just more of an observation that I've had over the last several years. And you know, Joe and I have been dating about two and a half years now. And um, so I can see, you know, I see like the, the inside story of what's going on. And I see how much effort not only goes into a club deciding who's going to be their target setter and, you know, the proposals, the, the decision making and all of that. But then, you know, the decision is made. And then that person is making plans to go to that event and, um, you know, flown in, drove in, put up in the hotel, whatever, and is setting targets that will make or break that event. And, you know, we, we all know there's plenty of events where targets have been set that people get really upset. They want to leave. They want to never shoot again. Um, they get really, you know, super frustrated and... And to me, that's the making or breaking an event. So uh, an event really rides on the target setter and their abilities and what, you know, what kind of targets they're setting. If they are paying attention to the 400 shooters or 500 shooters and their skill levels and setting targets that all of those people will enjoy and they'll still be challenging and still be fun. You know, if that's not being done, then there's a lot of people that will be upset about that event. Um, so I just really see and feel that the target setter can make or break an event. And in my opinion, um, I think in other industries, that would be a little bit more recognized, you know, like Quail Creek would, you know, Jack Links 
yeah. annual event with Target set by Joe Skull. You know, I just feel like it's something that would be put out there. Not that Joe wants that because he's rolling his eyes and he rolls his eyes every time that I bring this up because he's not looking for the notoriety. He's not interested in that. He doesn't want that. But what I'm saying is as a club owner myself and understanding what goes into these events, I think it's important for a club to say target set by so and so because not only that but there's styles and techniques of these target setters so that can draw shooters or not i guess <laughs> if they get a target yeah. setter people don't want but if it's a target setter that people like and they enjoy those targets then i think a, a club should put it out there and, and be part of what they're promoting um, in order for people to know what they're getting that's another thing I was uh, I have observed is people are like who's setting targets at such and such. It's this question people want to know, and so I just feel like the information should be put out there as part of the club's um, marketing for their event. Well, that that's you know, there's a lot that rides on that because, you know, Sean here here him and I locally here we really enjoy Dan Bailey's feet test targets. I mean he he sets phenomenal feet tests. So we we know if Dan setting a target somewhere. We want to shoot those locally, right? Because he's so good at them. Um, we've shot Joe's target several times at Jack Lanks, and we shot at Northeast Regional. He was the target setter there. I really enjoyed Joe's targets. So for me, as a competitor, I want to go shoot Joe's targets. So that, I, I understand what you're saying about that. You know what I mean? That can really draw someone in, or if it's maybe a target setter they don't like, it, it might push them away. Right. So. Gotcha. Um, Jason was saying something about uh, when you guys were talked talking. The next thing you mentioned was was recognition. Can you dive into that a little bit? Uh, basically, what I was just saying that to me, I feel like a club um, should say, you know, target set by so and so or main event set by so and so and so and so. And like that's not to stroke their egos. It's to so that people like just sitting here with you guys in the last few hours. I've heard you asking. Who's set in the main event? Who's set in feed task? Who's set in this? Yeah. Like, these are questions that shooters have. And I just feel like a club should put it out there on the front end. It should be like main event set by so-and-so and so-and-so. You disagree? They do do that. Yeah. I don't see it in the marketing. And They do it. Yeah. Well, we, now we did We did for the Ohio State shoot. We had Jake in the studio, and he told us, look, you know, Joe's going to be setting this, this, and this, and Eli's going to be setting this, this, and this. But there are a lot of shoots where... We don't know who's setting the targets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, and there really is. I mean, there, we go to a lot of shoots that we don't know who's setting them. Maybe they don't want to know who set them. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's probably US a lot of Open. truth to that. What's that? U.S. Open. Yeah, you know, I mean, that was a big one. I mean. Not everybody knows who set those targets. Uh, yeah, and so Chad just made a, a comment, and, and I'll strengthen that. Not everybody knew who set the targets this, in this past year at the U.S. Open. You know? That should have been front and center, in my opinion, um, because people like Joe do deserve the recognition. And if it is a target setter that's wildly accepted, it's going to draw participants. I really believe that. Um, hey, Joe, I want to I want to switch gears here for a second. So at the Northeast Regional uh, there at Eminem, you stood behind me while I shot one of your stations, and you get to lo- you get to watch a lot of shots at your targets, and you you know, and that's very cool because. You care enough to go out and watch people shooting your targets and see what's going on. Um, what are some of the most common mistakes you see a shooter when it comes to reading your targets, and how do you use that to steal a target or two from them on a card? Most of the shooters don't pay enough attention to the line and their hold point. And that's that's what you saw with me yeah. when I was shooting your yeah, the one station you right. said there on Super Sporting. You're like, Jason... You had the right technique. You had the right lead, but you you were so far off in the line. You had to make. You had to compensate for that. I remember that conversation. You have to try to we fix had. it, right? And a lot of times you don't have time to fix it, right? And that's exactly what happened with on that. Target. So is that the most common mistake you see? Pretty much, or they or they can't judge distance, and they think the targets are a lot further than they are, or they they look at the target wrong and they read the speed of the target wrong. Depends on the background. You get in certain backgrounds. You get in the wood wooded area. And targets will appear to be a lot faster than what they really are. Yeah. They're not as fast as you think because they're going past trees. It's close. It looks fast. Then you put a faster target up in the sky, 
and you can't read the speed of it. A lot right. of shooters cannot read that speed. You don't have that background for reference. You don't have background, but if they know what to look for, then they know they know the speed of the bird. So, when you see po- people making these mistakes, is that how you try to get that one or two targets off their card? Is by getting them to misread the line? In other words, you're not trying to beat them with speed and distance and, and eye tests and all that stuff. So... When you're when you're setting a, a good technical, which is a transitioning target, I, I think we can all agree to that. When you're setting that, are you trying to get them to misread the line? Most of the time, they'll misread the second bird. Okay. Because of, because of the gun position I'll put them in, they won't get the gun in the proper spot soon enough to connect with the target. Makes perfect sense. No, I get it. And, and along those lines, I mean... You've set targets for pretty much everybody in this country. I mean, is it a personal victory for you when you kind of mess some of the greats up in this game? I mean, when you can trick Anthony or you can trick Zach or somebody of that caliber? Well, when you, when you do it as much as I have and you've watched all these guys shoot, you kind of know targets that they struggle with. Okay. So, you know, yeah, you can set, you can set targets and say, well, so-and-so is going to have a problem with this and this one's going to have a problem with that. And you know, I know I know a lot of targets that a lot of the shooters have issues with, whether I set them or not. You know, I I don't go out there and say, okay, I'm going to beat so and so. I'm going to set four targets. I know he he struggles with. You know, I just I just go set my course. Okay. And it it falls the way it falls. So you're not really going like after an ego thing, like I no. I tripped up Anthony or I no. tripped up you know whoever. No. So okay. Because most of the time, you know what they'll miss? They'll miss some stupid target. Well, you know, that's that, my life story, Jason. That, I just missed the yeah. stupid ones. And this is hilarious because this is the next question I have here for him is one of the things we loved about being scald <laughs> is that you can manage to steal a target or two from the very best, even at 25 yards. It's got to make you chuckle from time to time. I mean, you you really pay attention to shooters when they're shooting your targets. I've seen you at a tournament. You're on the four-wheeler. You're on the golf cart. And the whole time, you're not just making sure things running smooth. You're back there watching people shoot your targets. It's got to make you chuckle when the very best misses one of your targets at 20, 25 yards. Well, sometimes I'll put something out there that I know is going to make a lot of people stumble. And, you know, you'll ride around the course and you'll go to that station, you'll watch, and there goes somebody dumped three of them. This guy dumped two of them. And and that becomes a station you go check a lot because you want to see – then you want to see who does what on it and – how many people you actually tricked with that target? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And Sean and I have talked about this a lot before on this podcast is I know when they're great targets and, and we because we'll leave a tournament and it's like, I should have had this, I should have had that, you know, and you're you're frustrated with yourself and you feel like you got beat. Okay. But when you leave a tournament and you feel like you've been beat up those, in my opinion, are bad targets. You know what I'm talking about. Do you want to explain? I exact, well, yeah. I'll explain it to you the way I see it. If I put targets out there and you go up there and you look at them and go, well, oh, yeah, I got this, and you drop one or two of them, you no longer are upset with me for setting the, for what I set. You're upset that you feel as though you should have broke that target. Exactly. But, exactly. But then again, you were probably not on the line for that bird. Right. You know. But we got beat. You you beat yourself. Right. I exactly. Didn't beat you. Right. You beat yourself. I'd rather see you beat yourself. Yeah. So explain the feeling like beat up part. Beat up part is when you throw these ridiculous targets that they're hard to see. The color might not be the right color where everybody can see that target. It's got a bad background, and somebody puts a ton of speed on it when you really don't need it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that we we've 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 sampled some of that before and it's it's never a good thing especially for young new shooters that are into the sport. You can really deflate somebody's, you know, go get them attitude about the sport if you really crush them on a course at one time or another. Well, we're supposed to be in the entertainment business. Right. 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 And we're supposed to make you have a good time when you're there, but we're also supposed to keep you in line with that you can't break them all. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because I, I, I've heard people talk that think they understand this, and they always say the same thing. Well, you got to give them some targets. There's a difference between giving somebody targets and then beating them up the other half of the course, 
right? Versus, right. I want to see somebody go around a course, and, and myself personally as a competitor, I want to know that if I do my job, I can break that target, right? If you did your job, I'm going to misread what you put out there, and I'm going to miss. Or I'm going to drop one or two here or there because I misread the line. Yeah. So it, it's a test of your ability, not a test of your eyes, in my opinion, that makes a good target setter. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be an eye test. And and these um, separator stations that some of these guys throw, the separator station's good. You can, you should be able to give them one bird on that separator station sure. out, of the, out of the two. You make one target hard. You don't want them walking out of there. 35 people walk out there with zeros. Right. Yeah. You want you want that one target so that, you know, make the first target real real hard, and the second target, they should get it. But they missed two of them because they got frustrated missing the harder one. Well, I, I'm not going to call out names. I'm not going to call out a specific tournament. But, look, Sean and I watched a guy that's a world and national champion, zero, two stations at a very big shoot, very well-known shoot. And to me, I think that's that that should never happen. No, it shouldn't. Um, um, Don, this is where it gets interesting from a mental standpoint um, of targets. Um, we've seen you at tournaments, whereas you'll pick a station and you'll do an analysis on a set of targets and talking about the anxiety that's of that presentation. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, we've seen you at Nationals do it. We've seen you at U.S. Open. We've seen you at uh, Jack Links. You did it. You'll pick a station and a certain set of targets that maybe builds some anxiety in somebody um, when they see that presentation or, you know, maybe it's because they feel a little rushed or something, even though they're not. Talk about the mental side of target setting. The first time I did that was at Nationals a few years ago, and it was because Joe was like, you should go over that station over there and watch the people because he, he saw that they were shooting them in the, in his opinion, the opposite order, right? Uh -huh. And so I just went over there and I sat on the bench and just observed for a little bit. And it was really fascinating because, you know, one squad would come up and the first person shooting, they were all like, just totally trust in that first shooter, you know, and he was going to shoot this one first and he's going to shoot that one. And he was even verbalizing it and telling everybody. And they're like, yes, you know, like he was the God and he knew what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they all followed suit and they all missed. And, and then the exact next squad would come and they would do the exact opposite, you know, and it, it was really interesting to watch them all kind of scramble. And then, you know, all of a sudden one guy would, would break both targets and, he would do it in the opposite order than the rest of them thought. And then I'd hear them talking about it and be like, oh, I'm not going to shoot it that way. I don't know how he broke them. And it was just really interesting because it was messing with their heads big time. And not only were the targets messing with their heads, but also the squad mates, not intentionally, but like whatever, depending on if they thought that person knew better. And so they were watching and then mimicking that person or, um, you know, that person broke the target, so let me do it that way, even though that wasn't the way I was planning to do it. Or I don't like that way, even though he broke the targets, and then they would shoot it their own way. So it was yeah. just this, you know, interesting thing of watching them be frustrated, not knowing how to read and not knowing which one to shoot first and the scramble that was happening. And it was different for each squad. Um, Sean, you and I have goofed off setting targets for the – the dead pair prelim attempted to set at the, the targets at the night shoot, yeah. the dead pair prelim uh <laughs> setting those targets you you've learned a little bit oh yeah i mean you know I, I think as a shooter you know for me i focused on a few challenging presentations that i knew that caused me grief you know so i set two or three stations of targets that i remember that beat me and i thought well okay that's going to be my hard ones and then I gave a few easy targets, you know, like something that you could clubhouse or something that always made it fun to shoot that station. And then in between, I just kind of threw middle of the road stuff. And I don't know if that was your approach, Jason, but that's how I did mine. Well, I, I, and I know you've, you've taken target setting classes. You're yeah, a little bit further well, ahead than I am on that stuff. Okay. But, but previous to that, um, <laughs> I, I, I just think that the dead pro prelim is, is kind of should be, goofy fun you know that's kind of our mental aspect when going into that but 
the clubhouse. You know, everybody talks about getting two targets with one shot. It's just so cool, right? So last year, I made this attempt of I'm going to give the, them the illusion that they can clubhouse these targets. And what I did was I put a trap on each side of the station about 10 yards out, and I made them cross and come together. And it looks like they come together, but they're actually separated by about 15 yards front to back. So even if you did hit the front one, you're not going to hit the back one. Unfortunately, I had people that are very good friends of mine wanted to wrap their barrels around my head. So I learned not to set that one anymore. Um, it's interesting, though, because I did take Anthony's target setting class, and, and I'll go ahead and share this conversation with everybody. I was riding around with Anthony on a second day there, and uh, he goes, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I said, you know, Anthony, I said, I... I saw a lot of traps and a lot of times i'll be asked to set the targets for their five stand they'll buy a five stand package and uh, i said i you know i thought i'd come to your class and pick up on a few things and he says yeah sure and i said uh, i learned after the first day i don't know squat and he died laughing and but you know what there's i had no idea there was that much to it it's not just angle speed distance i mean there's there's so much that goes into it you know joe you you alluded to target color tonight that's one of them landscape background shot fall wind sun you know anthony told us that he went out and set what he felt was perfect and he got up the next morning and there's a 15 mile an hour wind they didn't predict and he had to rush out to the course and reset half the targets because if not it was going to create what would normally be a you know on a level of one to ten a like a five or a six station. You just turned it into a ten because it it was blowing the target so hard. People wouldn't have they'd have real short windows. So talk about that, Joe. I mean, you came in here tonight and you said that you'd already had everything set for the highest state, but. I know you, and I know your ability. You're going to be watching the weather very closely. Oh yeah, and and we've already discussed the weather, me and Jake, on, on the whole thing, and which way the wind will be if we have wind, and what to watch out for. So you basically already prepared for any scenario that yep. where you know where you've got to make changes right off if the I rip. Have to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, and and Joe, so when you're setting those targets, and I know this is another way of roundabout asking <laughs> the same question, but obviously. You know, after the tournament, you probably get some feedback from people, yeah, right? Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure there's been feedback that you didn't want, and yeah. you probably learned from it. We always get that. Yep. And then, but you know, whose feedback do you value the most? Is it is it the the top tier shooters that you really look for, to, to hear from, or is it the average everyday shooter? It's everybody. You can't just go by the top guys because it, let's say a top guy had a bad weekend, then he'll find some some of them. We'll find something wrong with it. Okay. Even though there was nothing wrong with it. <laughs> okay. Because it's not them. Gotcha. That's the best answer he could have gave. Yeah, it is. It Absolutely. Is. That's that's awesome. Even though the other three guys that shot 96, 97s, you know. Yeah. That don't count. Um, Chad, come over here close to a microphone for a second. You, You're you going to get close to me, Chad? you got to go sit on Joe's lap. Don't. It's a small room. You see, Don, I gave him the opportunity. And here, this podcast just went another direction. Um, talk about conversation we had about collaborating, Chad. Okay, so us shooters will collaborate about techniques, styles, how you, you know, I do clinics with David, and he, he teaches a certain way proprioception, this, that, whatever. I teach a different way. I teach a lot of the, all the different techniques because i feel i want a well-rounded shooter you know plus i have a lot of students that do trap skeet international bunker whatever so we're we're collaborating talking about hey i learned this have you ever thought about this or like i've spent time with derek and you know the whole don't shoot the picture conversation that you and i have do the target setters collaborate on what's next and what to do next and uh as far as what the next any, event or any anything like do you guys talk about um you know like okay guys you know we're all a team here maybe you're not a team you know and maybe you don't like some <laughs> of the target centers maybe you do maybe i'm going down the bad rabbit hole here but do, do you guys collaborate and talk about like look you know we're not going to go set at this place or that place because the terrain is is dangerous or we're not going to do this or, you know, this is the way we should do it. Like almost like a union, you know, like 
you know, you you know it as far as like you got the Carlisle method, right? That's you got that that group of shooters, right? And then you have the maintained out front proprioception Wendell right. Cherry group, right? Target setters, I see different style of target setters from different people. Correct. But do you collaborate between each other about what you guys do and how you do it? We might talk once in a while about, like, I might be at one club doing targets and somebody else at another one. How was that there? I got to go there next year. What was it like? Were the people good to work with? Did you have enough help? Things like that. And uh, find out what the other club's like if you've never been there. Now, because of who you are, and I know you don't like the notoriety part, but because you're such a good setter, do you feel that there are clubs you won't set at because of the terrain and the things that are just that are offered by that club that you don't want to put your name on it? I know that sounds bad, but I'm sure that there. Well, is I mean, there could there. be there could be a club owner or manager that maybe doesn't have the conscious thought of shot fall or something, you know. Well, I think all all clubs are concerned about all those things, and if if they're not, they're not in business that long. Right. First of all, um, there might be somebody you don't get along with, so that runs a club. So why would you go there and help them out? So I wouldn't go to a certain club that if I don't particularly care for the person or that club, I'm not going to go set targets there. Right. Do you ever right. get Do you ever get told to set targets differently than what your style may be, because they want you to do something different? Like, do they tell you what they want? Sometimes they'll tell you, you know, what kind of scores they want, but they okay. won't try to uh, tell me how to set my targets. If they want to tell me how to set my targets, they might as well not even call me. They can set them themselves. Excellent. <laughs> hey, uh, let's kick the air conditioners on for five minutes. Um, thank you very much, Elite Shotguns, Fioki USA, Bear Pelt, Atlas Traps, RE Ranger, Odo Pro Technologies, Rhino Chokes, the lovely Miss Don Grant that's joining us in studio. Vero Beach Clay Shooting, White Fire Targets, and Score Chaser. We will be back in just a moment. The Dead Pair. All right, Mr. Alley, we are back, and we're having one heck of a conversation here with Mr. Joe Skull. That's right. And Don Grant. Joe, I had a question for you. So, at the Nationals, this was, was it two years ago, Sean, you were there when we had the wind? Yep. And Anthony had stepped in the box, and he set up on a target, and he put his gun down, and the trapper said, lost target or whatever. And he goes, no, 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 come over here, young man. And he brought the trapper into the box, and he said, now watch, go ahead and pull that target. The wind was so bad, it was actually blowing that target to where if Anthony would have shot, he would have shot the people in the cage down the road. I mean, like, you know, the wind had got that bad. So, but what happens from a target setter's perspective, this is obviously a nightmare for you because the tournament's already started. The wind picks up, you know, it, in this case, three days later, you can't change the targets because then the competitors are shooting different targets than the guys did three days ago. So in that scenario, especially in a safety perspective, what do you do? You have, you have to make it safe. There, there's no other choice. You have to make the target safe. Um, by altering that target, you're trying to get it back on the pile where it was to start with, but the main thing is it's not a safe target. Right. It, if it's still safe and it blows offline 10, 15 yards or whatever, and it's shootable, it's an outdoor sport. We do not just go out there and tweak it for something like that. The only time we'll change a target is if it's a wind issue. The problem with the Nationals is we run that event for eight days. Right, exactly. And we could have four different wind directions, and it could be 35-mile-an-hour winds today and no wind tomorrow, and right. then 40-mile-an-hour winds out of the opposite direction the next day. Well, you know what I'm talking about in 2021. Yeah. That had to have been a nightmare for you guys. I mean, it really did because the winds got out of control. I mean, it is. it does get out of control. And then you guys asked me about target setting. When, when I go there, me and Neil go through... The winds, we all do, but me and Neil talk about it a lot. And we know the wind's going to be this, this, and this. I will try to set targets. Like, let's say I'm setting the green course and we got a heavy north wind. I'm not going to put a crossing bat two out there. I'm going to take that bat two and I'm going to throw it north. Yeah. So that it's cutting through the wind. Sure. Okay. So now when the wind, when the wind kicks up, you don't, you don't have this big flat target out there that 
the wing can carry 35 yards and on, it, it, onto the course. I try, it, I try to plan a lot of my targets when I know we're going to have bad wind conditions. I might put more spring on them. Right. I won't put as much belly on them. The more belly you put on them, the bigger they are, the more the wind pushes them. And with a bat, too, you also take the risk of it not turning face. Right. You know, it, it can hold flat, and then you're shooting yeah. at a credit card, right? And one of the worst targets, believe it or not, is a rabbit in the wind. Really? That rabbit that rabbit will change 15, 20 feet. It really, as heavy as it is, really. That wind will carry that rabbit and push it. It'll push it a lot. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Yep. So on the on the on the the word of safety, I mean, do you trump everything else when it comes to while the tournament's going on? If conditions change drastically, do you have the power, the yes, call we, to be able to we stop have it? To. We okay. have to. I mean, it's a safety issue. You got guns out there, and and if that target's doing like the situation you said with Anthony, and he shot that bird and shot straight down that. That line of stands. Right, yeah, you take you the know, risk of injuring so somebody. Yeah. You just can't have that. You got to, that's the only time we try to alter a target as if it's a safety condition. When do you throw Other than that, we do, do you, not. When do you throw out a target? So the question, in case anybody didn't hear, uh, Chad said, when do you throw out a target? That's a good question. It, it depends on, well, suppose you get the rain, you get the floods and stuff like that, and then at one station, two traps are underwater. Yeah. You don't have no choice. Right. Right. That, something like that you would throw it out um, most of the time we, we have enough stuff extra machines another lift let's say a lift goes down on um, the last day you're going if you have to throw that lift at that station down with that lift on it hopefully we have something we can put back in there and finish the shoot with it we try not to throw ever have to throw anything out we try to fix it um don you have Million shotgun sports. Mm -hmm. um, Joe is now setting targets at your club. Have you learned anything since Joe started versus before Joe was setting targets at your club? Have you learned anything as far as I mean, I'm sure you've learned a lot about target setting, but you know what? What are some of the things you picked up on? It's like, oh wow. Well, I would say it's not just the target setting; it's the machines as well. Yeah. Um, so he came in with a lot of knowledge related to the machines and um, the very first event he helped me with, I thought, you know, 64 machines, I thought they're all working fine. We had had several months with hardly any issues, you know, and he came in, he, he moved the targets around and, and within 20 minutes we're getting phone call after phone call. And he's like, what in the hell? Because he's like, I thought all your machines were good. And um, basically what had happened is you know, it could be a little brush or a little spring, just little tiny parts that we just didn't even know was supposed to be there or that it was missing or it had worn off or whatever. And so the the target setters that I had, my son being one of them, they had just started treating certain machines in special ways, you know, like this one shouldn't be tilted more than that, you know, and things like that. So um, it would that was the first thing that he really helped us with it, as he went through and he was able to see all the little parts and so yeah. it was a good year year and a half of buying lots of parts and getting machines <laughs> fixed and but then i you know a lot of things you're talking to him about are things that i just hear regularly we go to a lot of events together mm -hmm. and um you know i hear him talk about the targets um you know things like the sun and the way the courses are set up and yeah i like it, you know the, he's got a sense of humor about how he sets targets too he gets a lot of enjoyment out of setting targets and there's like a child like part of him that um he's he's got a very creative side like kind of the artsy side he's not an mm -hmm. artist but he's just got this creative side so you asked earlier you know if he's new to a, a stage um a club he doesn't know the lay of the land and all that but after he's seen it then the ideas just start coming like if he goes back to that club the next year he's thinking not on purpose it's just coming to him you know a few days before a week before what he wants to do and he's smirking about it you know in the yeah. middle of you know we <laughs> we've eaten dinner talking about something else all together and he starts smirking because he has an idea he's got something still <laughs> yeah yeah so he he's uh he really enjoys it and but yeah, I've learned a lot just by being around him. But um, 
he's teaching my son a lot also so listening to them and conversation that's very cool the stuff yeah um Joe, I don't know what else to call them, and and I, and I don't mean any offense by this because some of them are a lot of fun, but we've seen a lot of what I'm going to call novelty targets, you know, um, stuff off of trampolines, cut tractor tires. Skipping off of water. Skipping off of water. We've seen, um, you know, Atlas is guilty of it. They built a loon target that flies upside down and... You know, it's really cool off a tower because it catches no air and it drops really fast. Or you can skip it off the water. Um, Don't forget we, the dead squirrel. Oh, yeah, with the dead squirrel. They take the spring out. They put a bungee cord in and they flop it off a tower and it falls down. We haven't seen you do a lot of that stuff. We've seen you get creative in other ways. You're not. Are you not a fan of that? Is that why? Or I want to... I want to set targets that I know. I'm not, if you're doing a tournament and you got 500 people like we do this weekend, I set some target that's skipping off the water or something. Let's say it rains and I get four more inches of water in that pond. It's no longer a consistent target. Now it's no target. longer the same target it was. Yeah. Let's say the wind's blowing and I got that skipping off the water. Now you got little little white caps on that on that water and it makes it rough. That target won't do the same exact thing anymore. Okay. I want to throw consistent targets. So you want to see consistency, it, right? Consistency is very very important on it because everybody's supposed to shoot the same targets. That's, that's and, well said. And anything that that takes a trap to a limit, or the target to a limit, there's a chance for it to fail. Yeah. And when you're yeah. putting that kind of numbers through it, so you figure if an eight bird stage, you got 500 people shooting it. Think about how many targets you got going off there. 4,000 targets off that one machine. Yeah. So, right there, you know, is it going to work for 4,000 targets the same every time, or are you going to have something change in it, and they got a problem? They're, they're fun to throw in fun shoots. Yeah, right. A one-day shoot or something like that. But you don't want to run it in a shoot that you got to run big, big numbers on. And and I, I think either you took a page out of Anthony's book or he took a page out of your book. But when I took his target setting class, you know, he set a rabbit up and it's like, okay, I'm not moving the machine. I'm not changing the spring. I haven't done anything. But watch, and he would throw one, two, three, four, five targets, and between the third and fifth target, something looked different. Right. And he'd go and get a rubber mat, and he'd put it for eight feet out in front of that rabbit, yeah. and he'd throw ten in a row, and they were exactly the same. Exactly. And he said, this is a problem, because that rabbit's hitting the ground, and eventually it's going to start forming a little rut, and then that little rut makes a little G-out spot, and it's jumping higher, or it's bouncing different. You have to have consistent targets. If you're going to run 300 people through your course right. to shoot that 100 birds, from guy number one to guy number 299, it's got to be the exact same bird. Other than, wind, other than weather conditions. Yeah. Weather, yeah, yeah. weather, you know, weather but, permitting. So. But if you don't put a mat down for a rabbit, you're going to run into a problem because it's, it's going to dig a hole in there. Depending on the soil, it's going to be worse. And I've been in places where you, you don't know what's underneath. And you start shooting for four or five days. I think in Kansas I did Claythorne. I did that U.S. Open that one year, and I threw a rabbit in there. Well, after about the fifth day, you start wearing the, the grass is gone, the dirt's starting to go, and now you're getting down to hard like type of rock in there, and then you start having broken targets out there. Yeah. So there are things you got to look at. Is it along the same lines? Is there limitations to certain machines that you keep in mind with how they can throw targets or? Yeah, you just you just don't want to take that machine and throw it on its extreme. You know, you could tilt them so far. You know, if you start tilting it way back and way to one side, and you start putting a ton of spring on it, a lot of times you're going to have you're going to start having breakage. Okay, you're better off just taking off five degrees from the back and and don't tilt it as far and take a little bit of spring off it, and that target will throw flying. We're already these machines are throwing targets at angles that you would not even try to do 15, 20 years ago because the machines wouldn't do it. Right. They got so many little plastic clips and weed whacker string and stuff that all these trap makers have figured out how to hold that target on that plate when that target's in, that trap's set in an extreme condition that it'll hold the target. Sure. But don't let one of them weed whacker strings break off in the middle of the shoot. Then you're in trouble. Because you gotta go, you got to go replace it. Right, so exactly. That's what you got to watch. And and if you're paying attention to stuff, when you set that, you'll look under there and you'll say, okay, they, 
all that weed whacker string looks good. You don't have two that are frayed, wearing out real bad. If, if you have that, you either change them or don't set that target. So they just had the world championship in both Hungary and in uh, England at uh, EJ Churchill. There was a lot of talk about targets. Um, now, of course, international targets are different than what we throw here for the most part. Um, but, and what I mean by that, for those that don't understand what I just said, is the international target's a little bigger, a little heavier, flies a little farther, faster, and maintains its speed more. Did I say that correctly, Joe? Yes, because uh, you can put a lot more spring on it. Right, you put a lot yeah. more spring on it. It's a little tougher target, and because of the it's mass, it'll... A little it, it'll, profile. Little lower profile. Lower profile. Yeah. Uh, and because of the mass, it's going to hold its speed a little longer. Right. But we struggle over there, and at the same time, the Europeans struggle over here. Exactly. But with that being said, there was a lot of talk about target presentations over there. Do you think the sport as a whole, and sometimes we kind of get wrapped up in our own country, in our own little world over here, if you will, but on, on a global scale, do you think – Target setting is starting to change a little bit in the sport. I don't think it's changing that much. I just think um, a lot of us guys that set targets and the trap companies are building traps that we can do a lot more with that same target. Okay. Which means we can give a better presentation than we ever gave before with it. As far as, I mean, how much more can you change? How much more further out can you put the target? How much more speed do you want to put on it? You know. Right. You, you're limited to what the shotgun will do. Right. Which it does a lot more than they ever thought it would. You did you did this 30 years ago and threw a target 55 yards, they would have hung you. Yeah, yeah. They would have hung you because nobody could, they'd say you're nuts. Right. But as, as time went on, you know, the shooters got a lot better. We start moving targets out a little bit and the shooters adapted to that. Now we move targets out further, but you're, gonna, you're at a point where you're at that boundary now, I believe, as far as throwing targets further I don't, yeah i don't see a point in it well you know sean if you if you take everything he just said you know you figure not only the guns but the ammunition i would say it's got a lot to do with it i would say the target technology itself has yeah. changed quite a bit and of course the trap technology if you look at what we started off with in the in the mid 90s dad and his friends if they could see it today they'd be like what are uh, you guys yeah, they, shooting they'd at, be lost know? yeah um and and you know it's I've seen people get frustrated at tournaments a lot, you know, target breakage and whatnot. And it, it's hard to imagine when you look at some big, huge crosser or some springing teal that's going 85 feet in the air. We are literally throwing eggs. We're throwing a, a target that's as fragile as an egg. And people get upset because of breakages or stuff like that. And it's really, it could come down to who loaded that machine. It was a problem, right? They dropped the stack of clays in, and they the hairline fractured the whole stack. And guess what? Now we got problems. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that that's a factor, right? I mean, that's a problem. Well, the, the targets aren't that fragile, really. If you think the pressure they're under being thrown, it's a matter if the machine is set right. If the right. machine's set right and the targets are handled right, you don't have issues. If a guy goes out there and he sets a a hard, fast target. And he doesn't throw 15 off the machine, and every 15, all 15 of them throw and no breakage. That's fine. But if he has the third one broke, the sixth one broke, number nine broke, you got you need to fix that before because it's going to continue all yeah. day, you know. And if they're not paying attention to that, and next thing you know, you got a big backup there. You got four squads there because it's the second bird and a, and a report pair, and it, it's taken forever. Right. And and you got and everybody's mad because that trap keeps breaking targets because it wasn't made sure it was good before they they started the event. Um, <laughs> Joe, I'm, I, I got a I got a question written down here. It says, uh, "I'm sure after all these years of setting targets, there has to be a target that you would love to set, but for whatever reason you haven't set it yet." And 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 I'll I'll go a little further on this. Don was saying that you know you're you're at dinner or something and you're smirking thinking about setting a target. Can you tell us what that target might be? The one that you want to set, it's got to be in the back of your mind. Something off the Eiffel Tower, something crazy, something <laughs> different. You know what I mean? Joe Joe Skull is looking to a way to skull us all, I'm sure. So is there a target out there you've always wanted to set, but you just haven't? Any target I ever wanted set, I set. 
Okay. All right. Fair enough. That's. And, I was. I was it, waiting for this. And if it was a target that I wanted to set, and I said it wasn't good. I took it down. Okay, all right. I was waiting for, like, some wobble machine on a helicopter or something, but okay. Uh, I, and along like. those same lines, do you have a favorite target that, yeah, you, that what, you love to set? I mean, because you're, you know, let's face it, you're a competitor from way back. Is there a target that you just love to set? I like setting them all. Really? Like the, there's nothing. I love when I set my pairs, when I get that transition just right, where you just can't read it right. When it's just, it's just looks so, it looks so good, but it's so dishonest when you go to shoot that line. <laughs> when you were a kid, you didn't have the eight pack of crayons. You had like the big 64 color box and I had the big one, the big, big <laughs> one, six inches. Yeah. The big, yeah. yeah. The real big one. Sean Alley, you make signs for a living. Yeah. You yeah. need to make a big four by eight banner going into the front of every course that Joe sets it says you're about to be sculled about to be sculled yeah, uh, I think we, we need to set that up Joe <laughs> uh, and then at the end of the event we need to make t-shirts that said I've been sculled so yeah I like it there's your marketing idea <laughs> I've Joe I've been sculled go to dongrant.com yeah oh, there we go I love it I love, see I got all kind of marketing ideas going on <laughs> yes over here, you, you do yes, some you of do. them get me in trouble so I better stop there so um Joe, thank you. We thank appreciate you. it very much. Appreciate um, yeah, we appreciate time. you taking time out of, your, out of this busy time. I mean, you got a lot going on at the Ohio State. So right, to come over here and hang out with us idiots, we appreciate that. It was fun. Thank well, you. Okay. Joe, if somebody is listening to this and thinking, man, i got to get this guy out to set my targets. i got this big event coming or whatever. How can somebody find you? Just look on my website and uh, for Joe's call at cedarcreeksportingclays.com. Cedarcreeksportingclays.com. Yep. Okay, send you an email or there's a contact email, there. Okay. And if I'm not booked, I'll more than likely do it. Awesome, awesome. Of course, Don Grant, uh, all your information is down in our show description. They know how to yeah. find you. Um, if they can't find Joe, they can probably find you and, and they kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. Yeah, I he's like in it. Florida setting targets at my club once a month. He's setting targets at his club about once a month. And then he's all over the country besides that. Well, we're about to be neighbors, so I'm, you get to see more of my ugly mug. Good. It's coming. Lucky Good. you. Yes. <laughs> yes. I want to come teach at your club. What? I want to come teach at your club. Yeah. Which one? Yours. Mine or Don's? Well, we already talked about I've already got that here. Okay. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Oh, boy. Chad Roberts is invading the South. He, he destroyed and, the West. He's moving North. South. And the Northeast. <laughs> and the Northeast. Oh, man. Chad we're, Roberts World Tour. We're all about to be rad. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, Sean Alley, we tell everybody every week to take someone new shooting. Joe, you probably introduce a lot of new shooters at your club yep. uh, on a week-to-week basis. We get a lot of them. Do you? Yep. And, and Don, you probably do the same at Millie Shotgun Sports, I right? Am. Yep, lots. Isn't it awesome? And, Joe, you do a lot of coaching at your club, too. Um, the, the look on someone's face when they're struggling and you walk up and you help them and they crush that target – the look on their face when they turn around, it's priceless, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and half of them turn around and they just shake their head. They're like, I can't believe it was that easy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. And Chad gets a lot of that gratification every day when, you know, with his coaching is, and I, I've, I saw it, I witnessed it, you know, from his own students. And because I did a bunch of shooting with Chad in California. He, he did it to me last year. Yeah. I did it yeah. to Malcolm's wife yesterday. Yeah, uh, Miss Melanie Parker. Melanie, okay. You know, we, we went shooting just yesterday at uh, Airport Ridge. Uh, she's such a sweetheart. And he's like, do you mind if I... She's like, please. And within seconds, and, I, and we shot with her again today, and I looked at Chad and I said, thanks, dude. Thanks a lot. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, she's in double A about to shoot the Ohio State Championship. Now Sean and I got our hands full. So that girl is crushing it. Yeah. <laughs> so... um. Thank you both again. Thank uh, you. Appreciate it tons. Um, Sean Alley, every week. Take somebody new shooting. Get a gun in their hand. Show them how much fun this sport is. It sells itself. But really just get them out there. Get them on the course. If you're not taking somebody out new, you're not helping grow this sport. And that's what we keep preaching week in and week out. And if they love the sport, take Come, them to a tournament. Take them to a tournament. Get them to a charity shoot. Just get them out there. And, and, and a lot of times, I think just the... The thrill or the challenge of competing is what motivates a lot of people to get into this. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much again to Elite Shotguns. Um, 
Love us some elite shotgun, Sean Alley. That new color, it's working good. Hey, you know what? We had an all color squad yesterday, except for some guy from Germany was hanging out with us. But oh. anyway, yeah, uh, you should have seen the rack of those pretty colors. I'm gonna tell you what. I bet. Um, Fioki, Sean Alley. We have several Fioki people in this studio right now. And we love shooting us some little we rhinos. Love, we love the rhinos. We yeah. absolutely love them. Bear pelt again. Three bear pelt shooters in here. Don yep. Grant, do you have a bear pelt vest? I don't. Wait, mm-hmm. see? Okay. Don't we got to work on that. Yeah. We got to work, we gotta on, work that. on that. Step Joe, it up. you don't shoot anymore that much, do you? Once in a while. Do you have you a bear pelt vest? Nope. All right. Time for you to go. All right. <laughs> Atlas traps. American made Atlas traps. Now, listen, I, this would make your job a whole lot easier, Joe, if you had to use some American made Atlas traps, a toolless adjustment. RE Ranger. See that target clearly. See it farther. See it faster, especially with the new ultralight purples. Um, Odo Pro Technologies, we love us. Some Dr. Grace, uh, keeping your ears safe. Rhino chokes, barrel porting chokes, kickies, pads, you name it. Complete gunsmithing. They, they do, do it, it all. all. Yep. And do a damn fine job of it. Speaking of damn fine, Don Grant, thank you very much, young lady. We appreciate you joining us thank in you, studio. Um, Vero Beach Clay Shooting, Dead Pair Blast, December second, December first yep. and second. I'm gonna beat that. I'm gonna tattoo that on your forehead. I'm only worried about the Saturday. You better be worried. All right, white flyer <laughs> targets, Joe. You set you tons into. I, I bet you, you wish you had a dollar for every white flyer target you threw every year. <laughs> damn right. <laughs> damn right. <laughs> and score chaser, Don. They can find your club's tournaments on Score Chaser, right? Yep. Million Shotgun yep. Sports, as well as you, Mr. Skull. You are... I'm showing eye clays. All right, you definitely got to go soon. <laughs> and you can also find Chad Roberts on Score Chaser. Absolutely. Sign up for a lesson with that man. Yes. Chad Roberts has clinics, lessons available all over the country. Thanks, Chad, for joining us in the studio. All right, Mr. Alley, I've had about enough of you. Until next week. Can't wait to see you all back here on the Dead Pair Podcast. We'll see you next time on the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by Elite Shotguns and Vero Beach Clay Shooting and is fueled by Fioki USA. The Dead Pair theme song was written, arranged, and produced by Toby Tomplay. Special thanks to the following sponsors. Bear Pelt, Rhino, Odo Pro, Dawn Grant, Atlas Trap Company, RE Ranger, and White Flyer Targets. 